let me say at first that it is a privilege and honor to moderate uh, this panel with nexus of such uh, esteemed uh, co-panelists like Tibi, Konduri, uh, Carlos Alvarez Pereira, Stepan Bruch Huber, Alexander Kovacevic, and uh, Josep uh, Gary. Uh, for, for intro, let me say that without any doubt, uh, supremacy of dominance habit in terms of people against nature as well as people against other people. Uh, human egoism as a uh, mindset and market fundamentalism uh, as a mind setting rapidly and continuously destroying the natural and human capital as well as sustainability, which means security of the economy, society, and the planet as a whole. From the Great Recession of 2008, particularly until today, despite exponential development of new technologies based on the last two industrial revolutions, the humankind has entered in the period of regression, namely the period of wasted opportunities, something what has not been anticipated in the strategic audit of the growth potentials of this area. Even more, exponential change in almost unlinear economic system and almost unlinear social system full of uh, so-called uh, echo chambers is difficult to manage due to incapacity to deal with some kind of changes. Problem persists more than 50 years without solutions. Paradoxically, in time when universal connectivity becomes a new free good, understanding potentials of frontier technologies like AI, quantum computing, and synthetic bi biology is not available for, for application. It is poor, incomplete, and unimplementable. Paradoxically, technological development is perceived in this era as a threat. How do we explain this paradox? The root cause of such multi-crisis lies in fractured socioeconomic system full of fault lines and misconceptions, all exacerbating and expanding inbuilt structure imbalances of the socioeconomic system and the anomalies of reaction policy measures. In 100 trillion dollars, world economy, key planetary imbalance is a climate change. Anthropogenic impact of global warming transformed the conventional weather in so-called weather of mass destruction. The acronym of, of this previous con uh, construct is WMD. From other side, in economy full imbalances like financialization, securitization, income concentration, deindustrialization, etc., competitiveness is eroding. Using geopolitics in some economies as economic variable to restore competitiveness is counterproductive. It is not panacea, but it is most disruptive way to mitigate inbuilt imbalances, namely deepening them. Geopolitics and the end of the day leads to militarization of the economy and society and the greater use of so-called weapons of mass destruction. The acronym of previous construct is again WMD. Weather of mass destruction plus weapons of mass destruction mutually assured in double WMD and probably will produce apocalyptic consequences because they continually ruining socioeconomic system, biosphere, and physical system. Shortly, the prospects of sustainability of the planet as a system dynamics in the terms of Jay Forrester. Shift from new normal to better normal required to restore common vision of sustainability. Multi-crisis, permacrisis, uh, crisis in the system of crisis, of any, needs multi-transition, colloquially named the green transition, transition that fit 
the purpose, to make sustainable economy both for the people and the planet as a whole. The green transition is a climate neutral transformation of industries related to energy production and land use, as well as introduction of the new lifestyle based on reversibility principle should lead to inherently sustainable economy. The green transition is collective responsibility of each national economy. There is no exception at all. Uh, the green transition is also path. Sustainable economy is the destination the Green Transition Action Plan we discussed today is the vehicle, localization of global ideas in the local geography. On global level, the Green Transition is opportunity for achieving global equilibrium between factor prices and factor incomes by respecting planetary boundaries and reaching so-called Pareto Optimum. Stefan sometimes is ready to point it out. From developing economies' perspective, it could be an astonishing idea to avoid middle income trap and accelerate catching up the developed world through climate neutral industrialization. Finally, and importantly, it is a way of greater convergence between developed and developing world, shared prosperity, and greater respect toward the global commons. Although the concept of green transition has borne in cloud of controversies, of multi crises. In this panel, we bring together not only pioneers and authorities from the field, but also radical believers in this concept. There is no lack of explanatory details in green transition blueprint between them. Most memorable moments from crystallization of this concept are circular model of growth, B, heterodox economic policy flat platform, C, green financing models, and D, implementation of sustainability-related disclosure based on ECG matrices. Our intention in this panel is to distill from the well-known blueprint we just mentioned, specifics of developed and developing economies and accessionate them throughout discussion. With such idea behind, let me start discussion with our first panelist, Phoebe Konduri. Many institutions, working groups, and other gatherings heeded by Professor Konduri have released applicable outcomes to mitigate climate emergency and related issues from the perspective of ECGs and from the perspective of the role of the technology and innovations. Question to Phoebe is going to be, Phoebe, would you accentuate key differences in green transition action plan between developed and developing economies from the perspective of technology and innovation? Please, we are listening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for a very um, holistic, an inclusive introduction. I will share some uh, slides uh, just to showcase a few uh, issues uh, that can answer the question on the differences uh, between the uh, implementation of the green transition in the global north and the global south. So indeed, we have this multiple crisis like you referred to, and it's a so economic crisis, low growth rates, inflationary pressures, shrinking fiscal spaces, but also um, this uh, confirmed situation where we have one third of the countries around the world being at the brink of default, and these are mostly uh, developing countries. Together with these economic issues, we of course have the environmental issues, climate destabilization and biodiversity collapse. And all of this is um, integrating into a big uh, social problem of increasing 
increase in inequalities between the global south and the global north, but also inequalities within countries and not just developing countries, but inequality, increases inequality uh, within developed countries. All these um, crises and um, not equitable uh, growth, non-inclusive growth, uh, yeah. is leading to geopolitical pressures, like you also said. So in uh, 2015, we thought that 163 countries have agreed that our escape route uh, can be sketched in these 17 sustainable development goals and the 169 targets within them. And the um, research group that I am leading, possibly the biggest uh, science policy research interface on the sustainability transition, uh, the biggest research team uh, in Europe and possibly beyond Europe called the Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation on IFORIA. IFORIA means sustainability uh, and it's a Greek, uh, a Greek world, is bringing together uh, various research and innovation centers, innovation accelerators, uh, technological, financial, fiscal, social innovations, uh, but also science policy networks and scientific associations and academies like the one that is hosting this uh, very interesting co uh, conference, the World Academy of Art and Science, in order to sketch science-based pathways um, for the transition to sustainability that are, however, uh, between the scientists and all other stakeholders, including politicians, policymakers, businessmen, um, financial institutions, and civil society. And what we see is that although um, the uh, agenda for the SDGs, which is an agenda for um, a sustainable interaction between the socioeconomic systems and the uh, natural systems is the global agenda. It's actually the only global agenda in addition to the Charter of Human Rights of the UN. Um, we see that the detailed transposition of this agenda into policies that are uh, directly implementable and financed is basically happening in Europe and um, roughly happening in other countries of the developed world. The transposition of this agenda is Europe is in Europe is called the European Green Deal that has many different elements to it and basically provide science-based policy designs, laws and regulations, and the relevant fiscal and financial framework that can finance these policies through public and private funds and also public-private partnerships in order to achieve the implementation of the green transition. However, in the rest of the world, although we have a huge acceleration of pledges to climate neutrality, which basically uh, translates to uh, use of renewables, circular economy, nature-based solutions, digitalization in immobility, uh, we definitely have a huge acceleration of pledges around the world, uh, both in the global south and in the global north. If we looked at the picture of the slide that I'm showing uh, on the left-hand side of my screen five years ago, there would be almost nothing. There would be just the 
at first announcement of the European Green Deal. But nowadays we have climate neutrality projects around the world. So the Global South is on board. It has the intentions to be climate neutral, to be uh, sustainable, not just with regards to climate, but with regards to the holistic interaction between the socioeconomic systems and the natural systems. But there are two points to note. First, that only Europe has a very detailed transposition of these pledges into a policy implementable framework that is well financed. And the developed work is much more advanced in terms of this policy transposition. The second point to note is that uh, the um, summation of all the efforts and promises and policies and regulations and law are not, is not enough to achieve climate neutrality, is not enough to achieve the maximum plus 1.5 increase in global average temperature by um, which is a, a, a cutoff point which uh, uh, safeguards our survival with the technology that we have in our hands. So indeed, we have a, a very different pace and um, that's why during the COPs, uh, COP26, COP27, COP20, uh, eight, we had a very vivid discussion of the loss of, uh, and damage fund, which basically allowed us to say that we understand that for global problems and the energy transition and the sustainability transition, uh, the developed world or the global north is um, imposing a lot of externalities on the rest of the world. The rest of the world has numerous hotspots of the negative effects. So we should uh, get together in order to restructure global financial architecture to allow financing of at least adaptation, safeguarding the, the, the people civil protection against uh, unsustainable practices. And one obvious one is climate change. So uh, I want to close by uh, focusing on this structure of the Global Climate Hub, just to make the, ch the which I, I chair, this is the UN SDSN Global Climate Hub that is working with the uh, 2,000 uh, institutional members of the Sustainable Development Solution Network under the auspices of the General Secretary of the UN, working with all the countries in the world in order to develop detailed national pathways towards climate neutrality and climate resilience. And this is how the whole energy transition should be dealt with. And here we made explicit what are the science areas that we should uh, tackle. So downscaling climate scenarios, figuring out the energy system transition, the land use and marine use system transition, health system transition, and socioeconomic systems transition in terms of financing the transition, but also uh, safeguarding the vulnerable from uh, the regressive effects that they might face during this transition. And all these systems need to be integrated into a holistic um, uh, pathway transition for each and every country, and then in regional pathways across the world uh, in this very explicit science-based mathematical modeling. And then there is is uh, uh, um, uh, 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 science exercise should be introduced to provide the capacity to the local stakeholders, both in terms of education, skilling, uh, reskilling, upskilling, and technology 
uh, but also using very informative local knowledge in order to refine the science-based pathways and allow uh, the transition uh, to happen in a way that the uh, stakeholders are engaged and at the end of the day, they really make the transition. Showcases the level of achievement of the SDGs in total across the Global South and the Global North. And you can see that uh, this is the average achievement of the SDGs as we publish it every year as sustainable development goals. And you can see that the most developed countries are the ones that are advanced with regards to that because they have the technology and the finance and the capacity. And you can see that explicitly, this is the picture for SDG affordable and clean energy. You can see uh, where you've got red is where you have stagnation with regards to the progress and where you have green is where you have achieved the goal and where you have yellow and orange is where you are trying to achieve the goal but you are facing challenges. So to cut a long story short, there are huge differences and mainly they derive from the lack of finance to acquire the technology, the infrastructure, but also the capacity in terms of knowledge and skills in order to implement the green and digital transition. And in order and to you, escape that- We will continue uh, with this aspect yeah. you just mentioned. Yes. Thank yeah, you, yeah. thank you for thank valuable you. contribution. We, we, yeah. uh, we have moved automatically to Carlos. Uh, Actually, after two and a half centuries of industrialization based on linear model of growth and more than uh, four decades of market fundamentalism, the planet is not enough for future development. For example, if everyone in the world lived like people in US in 2023, the global economy will require almost five planets more in order to satisfy global need for resources. One of the authors of last report of the Club of Rome, accentuated this problem, problem of limits to growth, is our following co-panelist, General Secretary of Club of Rome, Carlos Fer uh, Fernandez Pereira. Uh, question to Carlos. Carlos, under your view, have humanity lost momentum in searching for solution? Is this possible at all? If the answer is yes, are there any differences between developing and developed nations? Thank you. Thank you, Dragan, first of all, for inviting me and to, to was, uh, of which, of which, uh, of which I'm a fellow, as you know, for organizing this uh, outstanding conference. Yeah, the, your question is excellent because uh, honestly, I think we got lost in uh, looking for this unicorn that we call sustainable development. And uh, we have been pursuing a, a fantasy animal. And I would start by questioning two aspects of, of this. One is this categorization of countries uh, as developing or developed. And another aspect that I want to question is that we have been developing in the last decades. Um, why? Because nowadays, as my colleague of the, in the Club of Rome, Kate Rayworth, says, we could say there are no developed countries at all. No country is developed, which, of course, requires, requires a bit of explanation and ultimately uh, the redefinition of what we understand by human development. But let me show you just one slide. Uh, to illustrate uh, what I mean by what I just said. This is, I, uh, I assume many of you have already seen this slide or a similar one, you know, this graph, which shows a human development index, that's a UN indicator combining levels of um, GDP per capita, uh, health indicators and education indicators for different countries. So the dots, the color dots on the graph are countries versus um, ecological footprint, a concept developed by colleagues in the club 
um, Bill Rees and Matty Zakamagel, which measures exactly what you just said, uh, Dragon, how many planets do we need to certain our lifestyle? And, and this graph is revealing, you know, in many ways, because we see a very unequal, very different distribution of countries. Um, countries which achieve a high level of human development index, so on the right in the screen, um, have a very high ecological footprint, a totally unsustainable level of ecological footprint, which means, and this ecological footprint is ultimately related to the level of energy consumption per capita. It's not only energy, of course, but energy consumption per capita is a very good uh, proxy for for the for our footprint. So as you said, you know, the typical, I will call them industrialized countries in Europe, for instance, are around, are, we are living, you know, as if we had four planets and not one. And, and North America is even worse uh, than that. While countries who are whose level of ecological footprint is compatible with the with the bio capacity of the planet, so the ones uh, on the left down and and left in this graph are countries where the level of human development index is low. So it looks like we have an oxymoron when we use the expression sustainable development. As you can see in the quadrangle, which is in green there are no dots inside. And this is the reality we have to face, which has at the same time multiple dimensions. Um, one is that, oh, we have to think again about uh, anything like countries being, some countries being the, the good examples on which we can build. And particularly, we have to think again if we say, oh, Europe is at the leading edge of the of this, of the transformation. Um, we might be the most disciplined in terms of, of discourse and in terms of um, adopting policies, but, but the countries are completely unsustainable and then cannot be called developed. Another dimension, of course, is that there is a fundamental inequity when facing this transition. For me, it's more than a transition. It's actually more a transformation and even a metamorphosis of what we understand by a good life. You know? But the inequity is obvious in this graph and it's not independent. Let's not cheat ourselves thinking that, oh, you know, it's uh, some countries have been able to develop some countries have not been able to develop in the conventional sense of the term. And these two facts are independent from each other. No, of course not. Uh, we have uh, developed, so-called developed industrialized countries. We have a big debt towards the, what we call the developing, uh, the developing countries, particularly in terms of the accumulated ecological footprint since the beginning of the industrial uh, revolution. Another dimension, another interesting aspect of this graph is that there are actually a number of countries which are not so far from this rectangle of sustainable development, the, the one uh, which are highlighted here. This is based on data from a few years ago, but actually it does not move much. And those countries like Philippines, Jamaica, Ecuador, etc., have relatively high levels of um, uh, human development thanks to combination off, but uh, generally relatively high levels of health and education indicators and uh, levels of ecological footprint, which are compatible with having one planet. So maybe we have to rethink this question that you were asking. Also because, uh, yes, we see, for instance, a, a substantial backlash in Europe regarding the European Green Deal. We are just three weeks, a month away from the elections to the European Parliament. Let's see what happens there. 
and but but there, the, there is a big paradox in seeing you know the EU Green Deal, which among other things is about restoring our connection with nature, being contested by the people, the only people who in modern societies are living every day, every moment, every hour, every minute in contact with nature. Uh, the, so the, the farmers. So something has not been going well with this definition of European Green Deal and the, and the design of policies and so on. But to end my intervention, my provocation would be actually we have to revisit the concept of development. What is a good life? What makes what are the factors driving well being and health? And realize that in the last decades, so probably many authors say uh, we reached the climax of development in a human and social sense of the term. We reached the climax of that in the so called developed countries 30 or 40 years ago. So maybe what we have seen since then is not development. It, we have been cheating ourselves. Yeah, a lot of technology, a lot of material consumption, of course, but is that human development? Did that contribute to health and well being? Not so sure. So revisit the concept of what is uh, human development, what it is to be human, what drives health and well-being. And just the last, very last idea, what if we had to learn together across this chasm, which is so obvious in this graph? What if we had, we the countries which we consider ourselves developed, what if we had to learn from uh, countries in Africa and in Latin America and elsewhere, elsewhere that we have been considering as developing and that we, you know, we say we are helping them to become like us. What if the exercise of metamorphosis was much more an exercise of mutual learning in which we have a lot to learn from their cultures about what it is to be human and what it is to have a good life? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Carlos, uh, particularly for keeping the time limits. Uh, the, the, the idea about re revisiting uh, uh, developing model and define the new model of growth uh, is a pretext for the, our next panelist, uh, Stefan Bruch Hube. Uh, Stefan is a, a very interesting person, let me say, uh, person with very rich and diversified background. It is polyhistor uh, of modern time in full capacity. So we know uh, we know uh, his interest, and uh, this is the simple uh, I can say about uh, his background. Uh, to run the green transition uh, shift from brown industry to energy uh, and uh, land use industries based on the climate neutral technologies, so-called uh, green transition, is an uh, important uh, aspect of green transition. Question to Stefan. From which sources capital come from predominantly to finance transition from brown to green industrial portfolio. Does so-called green quantitative easing, your idea about financing matter, and related to previous, is using ESG matrices in mining and extract industry possible in this transition? Please. Dragon, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I did not introduce the idea of green uh, QE, it's much older. Um, um, I would like to make some short comments uh, on uh, how to shift from brown to green, uh, some preliminary, preliminary ideas. And uh, the first slide I would like to share is, I call it the economics of transformation. Right? If you look at historical data, ODA data, AU enlargement, German reunification, uh, or the Marshall Plan, they requested about 0.71, 1, 1.5% of GDP in order to transit, right? To transit, let's say, with an AU enlargement. 
what we're realizing is and see at the date of the global transition we are facing now from brown to green is about six to eight, even more times higher than the one we were talking in the first place. Second comment. If you look at the costs of externalities we've been caused already and the entire underfunded comments we have on the planetary level, we are in a situation, public health calling a secondary preventive approach. And secondary preventive means the damage is set and we now have to cope with the rising costs ahead and keep them as low as possible. Right, And if you look at the interventions, we can call them TRAP. T stands for transferring money through fees and fiscal policy. R is restructuring uh, death and loans. A is austerity policy. P is privatizing the whole system. And the other P is we ask for philanthropy, for charity, for gifts. And if you take all these four aspects together, they will be very likely too low, too slow, and too late in order to face the situation we are in to finance the costs of externalities that are backlashing um, on our economy. Look at this graph. And what we, when we talk about um, uh, the economics of transformation, we're talking about a shift from A to C, right? Within A, this is conventional economics. We're talking about booms and busts, and we're talking about fiscal policy and up and down, but we want to transit our economy where we are at A, in order, which is brown, in order to reach C, which is green or regenerative or circular. You know, And as you know, 80% of the entire value chain is still depending on fossil energy. And we're still growing 3% globally within this 80% over and over and over again. So how can we transit from A to C in order to make sure that this liquidity, this capital is flowing in the right direction? Um, if we don't transit from A to C, we end up in D. We basically prolong the past into the future and we then end up in a downside of welfare and well-being, which is then another state of affairs, another state of society, which is then E or F. And if you look at the data, and we did that, in the mid, you see a plot of the required funding from brown to green. What we're doing right now is at the at the maximum uh, two trillion, two thousand billion dollars. And what's required is actually a shift from 2,000 to about eight to 10,000 dollars, uh, 10,000 million, a billion dollars. And these are all these S curves you can um, uh, measure and see when you try to shift an economy from A to C. And if you look, um, in order to uh, evaluate the amount that has to shift every year, we can we are used the so-called conversion rate. The conversion rate is the amount of economy which is entirely shifting from A to C, from brown to green. And just remember, the entire global economy is still growing 3%, and 80% of it is still depending on fossil, more or less. And each time we implement uh, a solar panel or a windmill, we still create wages and income and revenues based on the 80% fossil industry and the 3% growth process. So the conversion rate from brown to green, you can measure that it's roughly 5 to 7%. So we need to change about 5 to 7% at least from the brown into the green in order to make sure that we reach from A to C. In order to achieve this, I think we are in a Keynes 2.0 moment, I think, and referring to your question. We're in a situation where pure national fiscal policy, or what I called the trap in my first slide, is not enough, and we need an augmented monetary policy that faces this shift from A to C. We could call it a COLA. A COLA is a conditioned liquidity assistance. It's a monetary facility that enables central bankers, regulators, 
multilateral banks, World Bank, IMF, to generate additional but conditioned liquidity to first fund global commons and second to hedge and mobilize private capital to shift from A to C. And here um, we can generate multiple new financial engineerings from public private partnership to state guarantees to hedging instruments, et cetera, in order to enable that shift. And then we are ending up in a situation called a Bretton Woods 2.0, where we not prolong the past into the future, but we rather dare to implement new financial engineerings to shift from A to C. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. As always, original ideas to find solutions in contradictory situation we live. Uh, and also, uh, this transfer from A to C uh, by keeping uh, the growth uh, Carlos just mentioned, uh, deep, uh, strongly depends on the energy transition because this is the great uh, contributor of investors and uh, uh, this is the great demand of the capital. So uh, your discussion is a pre pretext for the uh, question to our energy expert, uh, Alexander uh, Kovacevic. So uh, Alexander, what would you add uh, to the previous discussion from perspective of uh, energy transition. Well, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the question. I would say that uh, uh, first thing is, yes, transition is possible by 2050. It is feasible and it can be done. However, the other answer is not that easy. The, I think we have, and also listening to these presentations just now, it seems to me that uh, specification is of the transition is way too narrow. At this moment, what we call transition or energy transition paradigm, is dominated by electrification, digitalization, use of ambient energy, wind, solar, etc. And um, it's uh, it's uh, let's say a prerequisite for that for full electrification of energy is basically fantastic integration of the energy system. So what we have, uh, what is behind the sand, what we don't see as uh, on, on this, uh, when we are talking about transition, we don't see that it is essentially dystopian vision of the integrated energy system where some sort of supreme authority, artificial intelligence, people, governments, commands supply and demand in order to maintain integrity of complex electrical systems. That doesn't work. So that it's simply impossible to cover all electric energy needs by electricity. Mm -hmm. um, it also, this command have to be beyond limits of the feedback system. It have to be somehow uh, predictive. And then, of course, it affects human development. It limits elasticity of supply. And then, of course, it uh, invites the governments to do something in terms of financing, etc. So we have a combination. What we see today is Governments on one side uh, looking for resource rents, transit rents. We see the wars because of that. Uh, on the other side, the governments 
struggling with the sovereign debt to finance transition and fantastically high bills investment requirement for this transition. I I simply believe that it all this doesn't work. And I would like to to give a, a little suggestion on this. Let's try to, to see if we can share this. Um, it's a co-integrated system. So uh, with the with idea that co-integration between more complex energy systems where demand is covered not only by electricity but also by renewable methane and carbon dioxide looking into these three as a, as a fundamental energy commodities then it becomes feasible and it gives us an opportunity to repurpose existing infrastructure the investment requirement goes dramatically down. We are able then to, to actually imagine uh, that it is doable, that it is financeable in a, in a way. And to make things more important, there is no uncertainty of government intervention. Quite the contrary, there is a certainty of commercial markets where commercial players respond to the customer demand. I mean, when we talk human development, I like UN human development goals. I've been working in them for many, many years. Uh, but human development effectively translates into customer demand and customer choice. So. We need the system which actually responds to the customers and which uh, which serves the customer. So at this moment, the predominant paradigm is serving the government. What government tells us through contracts for differences, sovereign financing, feed-in tariffs, policy of this kind, etc., etc. So let's talk about the customers. And this is, this is, I believe, important. The other thing is, actually, we can, uh, what am I doing? Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, the, the, the sustainability criteria becomes much easier, relatively simple. And I have done a little calculation here using typical industrial uh, assumption that we may be able to produce hydrogen at $1.5 per kilo. And I see a number of big industrial uh, companies telling me that this is uh, possible. And the consequence of that is renewable methane in the price ballpark, which is actually competitive currently with LNG supply. So yes, we can repurpose existing infrastructure. We can transform the energy system at much, much lower cost. But the consequence of that is a shrink of the energy share in the GDP formation on one side. And on the other side, we need something which people are not don't like talking about, but we need a massive restructuring in international trade, both in terms of content and geopolitics. So I'm afraid that uh, current military treats, uh, risks, uh, security risks have, have to be addressed by very, very significant change in geopolitical relations in international trade. That's it. Thank you. Uh, let me, let me uh, say that it, it was the great pleasure to participate in the, this event. Uh, thank you for contributing discussion with valuable ideas. Uh, sometimes they was fascinating. Uh, thank you for opportunity to part participate in this event and get contributions. Thank you so much and see you soon.